This is an amazing stage, isn't it? It is literally like a tree stump. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alexia, you are a former editor for TechCrunch. You're now in the world of VC. Why are you so worried about the state of media right now? Ooh, all right, well, we've got 22 minutes. I could actually spend 22 hours <laughs> or 22 years talking about this. Uh, the reason I'm concerned about it, and I think the reason everyone should be concerned about it has to do with the fact that the current business model is rewarding uh, the worst angels of our, our nature. So uh, we've gone from print dollars to web pennies on an on a ads basis. So I guess and you're saying about the shift, you know, when we think about companies like the New York Times in the past being multiple, multiple billion dollar companies, yeah. this shift away from print to digital. But why is that a concern for you? What, what, what's the issue? So I think it's, um, I think in order to get those ad dollars, media companies have resorted to volume plays. And volume plays really play to base human desires. So, you, you know, you're an editor yourself. You've seen your chart beat. Uh, base human desires, anger, uh, free stuff, <laughs> winning, uh, you know, random tweets, things that, hum things that humans really don't... Um, I think a lot of this stuff is, is maybe related to what's going on in the world right now. I'm sure many people in the audience here, we're worried about what's happening with Brexit, you know, the, the, the B word I promised I'd never mention today um, <laughs> within the European Union and obviously where, where you are from the US as yeah, well. I have with the, the T word. The T word we're not as well. The T word. I mean, wh <laughs> what, why is it now that you're worried about it? Has there been something that's really prompted you or caught your attention? Yeah, I think what's prompted me and what's caught, us, caught my attention is fake news. And so I think the internet pre presents information in an equal format. So an article from the New York Times and an article from Hillary Clinton invented AIDS.ru or whatever your fake news site is look, ex look very similar. Yeah. So readers are, are coming across these articles and taking the information uh, on each at, at the same value. So that's creating kind of an alternate reality for all the people that aren't using critical thinking to filter out their news. But do you think that people generally, everyday consumers of news, do they understand that difference? Do you think there are people out there that can understand that nuance? I mean, I look at my Facebook feed now and it's even telling me when things are fake. So I think media people can understand that nuance because we're, we're dealing it, with it all the time. We have media literacy, that's our whole jobs. But I think the average person is very confused by journalism, by online media, by the purpose of media, by all of the jargon that we use. So off the record, anonymous sourcing, uh, they're confused as, as to why you, you'd have journalistic standards at a blog or, or journalistic standards at the New York Times and you wouldn't have journalistic standards on something like uh, Infowars. Yeah. I think we're not doing a very good job, or people in media are not doing a very good job of explaining the value of quality journalism versus just bloggy writing. And so much of this really comes down to trust, doesn't it? I mean, I, I, I'm really curious. We have an amazing audience here right now. Can I have a show of hands to see? Does anyone feel that they've lost trust with the media? Do you, have you, so we've got a couple here. Say that's a sizable <laughs> chunk of people yeah, here with our, with our sample at Slush. I mean, Can we ask them whether it's because the media is doing a bad job? Yeah, do you believe the media is doing a bad job? There's a few people out there. Okay. Do you think it's because it's too biased? Oh. Yeah. So over to you for the solution. Ha <laughs> ha. How, how do we rebuild <laughs> trust in the media? What how is do we build trust in the media? So for one, we have to eliminate the ad-based business model. I think people value things that they pay for. And I think if somebody pays $10 a month for a subscription to some news site, 
uh, A, that's going to pay for fact checking, that's going to pay for editing, that's going to pay for uh, better quality, quality journalists. But do you but believe that that's universal? I mean, I, I look across the media in the, in the UK where I'm from, and there are many touch points that people receive free newspapers at the train station. Um, we, have, we have a state broadcaster, the BBC, which you, we kind of pay for in a different way. Um, but not everyone pays for media. Do you think it's everyone should? Uh, I think everyone should in some form. I don't think it's an all or nothing model. It's, it's a la carte. It's multiple rev revenue streams. So it's some free, some paid, some events, some uh, uh, tote bags, I guess, is what <laughs> BuzzFeed's trying yeah, to do. Yeah, wasn't it the BuzzFeed's <laughs> solution to, to financial model was selling some tote bags? It's tote bags and kitchenware. So they're selling okay. pots and pans at Walmart. But uh, no, I think first off, you have, to, you have to kind of rethink the model of media. I don't think the ad model is serving anyone except for the T word and Kanye and Boris Johnson and a bunch of media savants that have uh, figured out how to uh, catch our attention or manipulate our attention. Because when writers write about the T word or the B word, people read. And that makes more money. There's a <laughs> the New York Times and a couple of different outlets have talked about how they got a Trump bump, which is after the 2016 election, many more people subscribed. Why? Because that, that media savant knows very well how to attract our attention through getting us angry, through calling uh, Mexicans bad things, through manipulating uh, people's nationalistic desires. He's, he is very good at getting us to pay attention to him. And unfortunately, the display ad model rewards that, rewards people covering that. So I think we need to wean ourselves off of ads, wean ourselves off of Facebook and Google, and figure out other ways to support journalism. That's one way. Another way is to actually, as tech people, build in mechanisms for trust. Yeah. So I'm invested in a company called True Story. And what True Story is trying to do is trying to use consensus to verify claims on the internet. And they're rewarding people who want to think critically about claims to go in and either upvote a claim or downvote a claim. What Facebook's doing with the, the flags on whether a story is disputed or not, that's the same kind of a mechanism. But would you say that the crowd is always the most wise on the internet? I mean, we've, we've, we've seen this go wrong a few times. No, nothing's perfect, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> nothing's perfect. Wiki, uh, Wikipedia seems to work, but again, you can put a quote on Wikipedia and have it have weeks pass before someone catches that it's fake. Yeah. Um, nothing's perfect. It's it's approximating truth, approximating honesty. See, the the, the thing that I've so. As they mentioned in the introduction, I'm an exit entrepreneur. I've sold to Forbes. And in my journey of learning about a company like Forbes, it's been really interesting to learn about the contributor model. So right now, we have 380 plus writers across Europe who are effectively freelance contributors. They, they contribute columns to Forbes' website. And as, a, as an editor, as a traditional journalist, I found that a really interesting concept to get my head around because it's like this giant newsroom across all of Europe, all these people putting different views in. But actually, the more I've learned about that process, I think it's quite beautiful because it means that we have this mul multiple viewpoints across Europe. We have viewpoints that us as traditional staff writers would never think of. And I, and I actually believe that it is a really potentially a big part of the future of media. I mean, would, would you agree? I, unfortunately, I, I am suspect of contributor models. I think uh, a lot of the times the voices that you get into those models aren't the, aren't the most vetted voices. I think they're definitely very biased. They have incentives to, to write on your platform, whether that incentive is pushing, promoting their startup, uh, promoting their, their services, or promoting some ideology. I think that there's a, a similar issue with native ads. So I, I read the statistic somewhere that 18% of, uh, of readers knew what a native ad was. That's when people pay to write a story about how great their, their business is on something like Forbes or TechCrunch. Mm -hmm. I think those also, native ads kind of are disingenuous and, and degrade trust. 
because they're presenting something like a media entity or like a journalistic entity when in actuality it's an ad or it's something that's been paid for. I mean, I, I would count that in saying that some people, I agree that sometimes people get confused and there are, there are definitely examples where you look at it and it's like, I can't tell the difference between editorial and not, but I think it's really interesting sometimes when you do involve brands and allow them to tell an interesting story that is not obviously advertising themselves. There are ones that are just, you know, obviously my company is great. I'm showing off. Yeah. But when you allow brands to be part of that conversation around a broader topic, do you think that that's a, that's a comfortable thing? I think it's an uncomfortable thing. I think in these times you really need to um, encourage voices that are uh, trying to find the truth in some way, shape, or form, are, are using evidence to back up their claims, and in general have a longer timeline from thought to publication. But how do we shift that framework then? Because we've, we, we now exist in yeah, this world know. where you yeah. know, everyone here is going to be looking on Twitter, wanting their news in real time. How can we move to a place which is more considered, more, frankly, old-fashioned? Yeah, I, it's, so cat's out of the bag. It's, it's like we've opened Pandora's box, and out of the box came uh, trolls, and Nazis, and incels, and weird Reddit threads, and porn. And you open the box, and all these bad internet things came, come out. We can't put it back in the box. We can't get everybody off of Twitter. Yeah, guys, get off of Twitter. Uh, we can't get people like me who don't have a publication now stop, you know, I want to write, I'm going to write on Medium. I'm not a journalist, I'm a VC writer and I have my own incentives to pr promote my portfolio companies. You're not going to get me to stop writing online just because the online information environment is toxic. What you can do and what the parable of Pandora's box teaches us is there's hope and I, I think that hope lies in, in innovators like you guys in rethinking the ads-based model. People like Jeff Bezos and uh, Benioff and especially Loring Powell, Powell Jobs investing in um, institutions like the Washington Post, investing in new forms of journalism. So uh, Loring Powell Jobs invested in a VR experience called Carne and Arena. And in this experience, you go and you put on the VR mask, and you're basically an immigrant trying to cross the border into, from Mexico into California. Mm -hmm. And once you've done that, you're, once you've gone through that experience, you're running, there's, uh, your, your family's behind you, your view of immigration is completely changed because you've lived through the experience of crossing a border. That's a form of journalism that's entirely new and I think increasingly will be relevant and a solution to the fact that all website writing looks the same. Okay. Yeah. I, I want to talk about the other B word, not Brexit, blockchain. Blockchain. So in the space of media, <laughs> a lot of people are talking about it. My own employer, Forbes, we're dipping our toe in with civil at the moment as well. Do you think it's part of the solution? I don't, not, not currently, no. I think, I, I, I think a token-based ne network like the company I've invested in is, but I don't see why blockchain would work where a simple database wouldn't, right? These ideas of using blockchain for distributed verification, um, for following the, where the sources have come from, to have like almost a distributed newsroom of editors, is that something that excites you in, as an investor? Uh, not currently, maybe. Maybe in the future, but right now I think it's very early days. Where do you see the, from your investor perspective, where do you see the, 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 the best possible short-term solution for improving the state of information at the moment? What's really got you excited? Subscriptions. So I've, I've seen companies that try to use the blockchain to bundle subscriptions. I'm excited about what Tony Hale's doing with Scroll. There's a company called, called Broadsheet that's trying to uh, get big publications to come together in a bundle where you'd pay something like $5 a month to be able to read The Economist and The Information and Stratechery. I think that's very promising. Um, I've seen companies that are trying to outsource local news to local residents, and I think that's actually a big part of the solution because a lot of the reasons people think the media is biased is because they don't see their point of view. And a lot of the times that's because their point of view is a local point of view. Yeah. yeah. 
do you think there's a bit of a conflict with local residents getting involved as well? Can they? <laughs> everyone's got their own agenda. <laughs> everyone's got. I mean, their own we, we have um, where I live in London. We use um, Nextdoor, which I, I know is big in the the US. The kind of local Facebook, and the, I can tell you there's a lot of conflict on there. Yeah. Y yes. <laughs> Um, um, I'm actually going to turn to some questions. We've had some amazing questions from the audience already. Um, as you've heard, you can send your questions in using Slido. Um, I've got a question here from Stella um, saying, regarding the business model, what is your real view? Are consumers ready to pay for quality content? Do you really think they're ready to get their wallets out? Yeah, I do. I, th I, th I think so. the history of newspapers in the US uh, there was partisan press, so it was, it was press for, for different political parties. And then it turned into yellow journalism at the beginning of the 19th century. And everything was scandalous and salacious and very much like the situation we're in now. And then at the turn of the century, in the 20th century, a guy named Arthur Ox bought the New York Times. And he was like, enough or took over as publisher. He said, enough is enough. We're going to start really printing all the news that's pr fit to print. We're going to charge up subscription. We're going to make sure people know that this paper has uh, standards of truth and honesty and adheres to reality. Um, I think people are going to start paying for news because I think we're, we're, we're in an epistemology problem where no one knows what's real anymore because people like Trump, and, and other media manipulators, it benefits them to confuse people to the point where they don't understand what's true. So I think, people, I think people will pay for news because we're in such a bad state that people are desperate for information that's actually accurate. And following on nicely from that, we've had a, an anonymous question. Mm. Um, older people are more likely than young to believe fake news as they're more trusting. Isn't that a problem that will, sol will solve itself eventually? <laughs> so, uh, as the older consumers uh, leave I'm, the environment. I really appreciate that levity. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, before it solves itself, it has the potential to cause a lot of damage, as, as Brexit is showing. I hope, you know, you can't in a society just say, OK, we're going to let the older people fall off the cliff. We're not, we're not, you can't, that's not how society functions. You can't just let a whole generation go. Uh, if I were ruler of the universe or Jeff Bezos or Lorene Powell Jobs, what I would do in America specifically, because I think Europe uh, has, is more critical thinking. In America, I would, I would provide a theory of knowledge class. I would, I would make it a part of public education from the earliest stages. So how we know what we know, what's real, how to, how to provide evidence for your assertions, what sense data. I would sit there and go from first principles, philosophy, how do you know if a story is true? And then I would offer that for, for the boomer generation as well. And I would incentivize them. I, I don't know how you incentivize that generation. I, I, I would ask people who are smarter than I how to do it. But I would make people take a class. Okay. I would make people take a media literacy class, theory of knowledge class. OK. Is mainstream media too one-sided and thus giving way to fake news? Ha. Huh. You know what? St studies show that it is one-sided. I think w one big reason people point to uh, as to why in the US people no longer trust mainstream media is that the liberal media or the mainstream media was so optimistic and hopeful for a liberal outcome that they really missed a lot of the signs that Trump was going to win the tw 2016 election. Yep. And this is a local news problem as well. And I think that's a function of people who, who become writers, people who become journalism, people who take risk like that are more open and, by definition, more liberal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, speaking from my perspective in the UK, it's really interesting that often people uh, make the argument the BBC is extremely left-wing um, and, and supports socialism. The, the right wing tends to use that narrative, but actually it's been proven in academic studies it's the other way around, and the BBC is actually slightly right wing. And often sometimes people can create this narrative to almost destabilize the other side. Oh, yeah. But I mean, I think that's one of the reasons people don't trust the media, because the right wing has told them not to trust the media. Yeah. Republicans want a republic. They want, they want a few people to, to run stuff. Democrats want everyone to run stuff. 
So you've had a really nice question here. People would like to know your own favorite media and recommendations. Uh, I really love the New York Times, even though I hated competing with them at TechCrunch. Hated. Because one thing the blogosphere has done is small blogs will cover a story, medium blogs will cover a story, large blogs will cover a story, and then it's the New York Times. And you're like, wait, we broke the story, link to us, which they never did. But as a, as a reader, I love them because I, I know that multiple pairs of eyes have seen whatever comes out and that they're really sticklers about accuracy. I love The Economist. I think if you just read The Economist and nothing else, you'd be fine. <laughs> Uh, I like books. So what I've been doing uh, in this current you know, unreal environment, I've been kind of getting offline and, and reading books and trying to be informed in that sense. There's a great book called Factfulness about uh, using data to come to conclusions versus sensationalism. Um, there's a book called Trust Me, I'm Lying about how PR people manipulate the media. I, I find that if you wean yourself off of the real-time news feed uh, march and go back to uh, more longer form, more slow materials like books, like The Economist, like uh, white papers, not the crypto kind, but the research <laughs> kind, uh, you end up being a more informed human. Do you think it's kind of interesting that you are someone with amazing tech expertise? And I see this a lot with people in the tech world, but almost going backwards a bit, you know, back to books, mm -hmm. back to that kind of traditional thing. It's yeah, I think, that, I think that's one of the solutions. I don't know if it's the correct solution because we're in the thick of it now. But there's a post-structuralist philosopher, uh, Baudrillard, who said that we're... Um, and we're a simulation, which is media, and it turns into a simulacrum. So that's when reality TV stars become presidents. And the, the way out of the simulacrum, or reality mirroring unreality, or reality mirroring media, is to get back to what's actually real. And that's going to first principles. That's, that's going back to Plato and being like, we're in a cave. Are those shadows? Are, are, what are those vases? It's, it's really stepping back and asking yourself, how do we know what we know? I think that's a fantastic point. And Alexia, thank you so much for being a great guest. Thank you.